Ever wondered how a house made of ice can keep you toasty? It's like nature's ultimate prank, using frozen water to stay warm. Igloos have been the cozy homes of Inuit peoples for generations, and they're basically the original tiny houses, just way cooler. But igloos aren't just random ice cubes stacked together. The Inuit people figured out this brilliant architectural hack thousands of years ago, and it's still mind-blowing today. Some travelers from the 1800s actually recorded temperatures inside igloos reaching a comfortable 60 degrees Fahrenheit, while outside it was a brutal minus 50 degrees Fahrenheit. That's like going from a freezer to a spring day just by stepping through the door. You'd think living in an ice house would be about as cozy as hugging a penguin, but there's something magical about these frosty dwellings. Most people assume igloos are just emergency shelters like the snow forts kids build in their backyard, but they're actually sophisticated structures that can last entire seasons when built properly. What's really fascinating is how these ice houses manage to pull off this temperature magic trick. It all comes down to some pretty clever engineering, and it starts with those thick walls. Because they're not just chunks of ice slapped together, they're more like nature's thermos. Each block is carefully cut and placed at a slight angle, creating a spiral that rises up to form a dome. What amazed me more is how the ice blocks actually get stronger as people live inside the igloo. When warm air hits the inner walls, it creates a thin layer of water that quickly refreezes, making the whole structure more solid. It's like the igloo version of working out at the gym. It gets stronger with use. The walls of a traditional igloo are usually around four feet thick. That's about as tall as a kitchen counter. Now you might be thinking, great, so it's just a really thick ice cube? But here's the thing. Snow and ice are actually fantastic insulators. All those tiny air pockets trapped in the snow work like countless miniature heat-saving bubbles. It's the same reason why your winter jacket is puffy. Air pockets are nature's way of saying, no heat shall pass. Scientists have studied this and found that the temperature difference between the inside and outside of an igloo wall can be more than 100 degrees Fahrenheit. That's like having a wall between summer and winter. The ice blocks used in construction are specifically chosen for their density. Too fluffy and they won't hold together, too solid and they won't insulate properly. It's like the Goldilocks of ice architecture. Everything needs to be just right. And the dome shape isn't just for looks. It's actually crucial for heat retention. Hot air rises because it thinks it's better than cold air, obviously. And the dome shape means there are no corners for it to get trapped in. Instead, it circulates around the top of the igloo, creating a nice warm layer above while the cold air sinks to the bottom. Speaking of keeping warm air in, you can't just cut a hole in the side and call it a door. That would be like trying to heat your house with the windows open in winter, which, trust me, doesn't work. Instead, the entrance to an igloo showcases brilliant Arctic engineering, carefully crafted to keep the warmth inside and the freezing temperatures out. Inuit builders create a tunnel that slopes downward before going up into the main living space. This tunnel can be anywhere from 10 to 30 feet long, plenty of space to practice your penguin waddle. But this tunnel isn't just for fun. It's actually a genius heat-saving trick. Remember how cold air sinks? Well, that tunnel creates what's called a cold trap. When freezing air tries to sneak into the igloo, it gets stuck in this lower tunnel like a kid in a ball pit. It just can't climb back up. Meanwhile, the warm air stays up in the living area, probably feeling pretty smug about the whole situation. Some traditional igloos even have multiple chambers in their entrance tunnels, each one acting like a tiny security checkpoint for temperature control. The air has to show its ID and get progressively warmer as it moves through each chamber. It's nature's version of airport security, minus the part where you have to take off your shoes. To make them even more efficient, many igloos have their entrance tunnels built facing away from prevailing winds. A study of traditional Inuit architecture found that this simple trick can reduce heat loss by up to 90%. That's like having a bouncer at the door who only lets in the nice warm air and tells the cold drafts, to take a hike. To add to the warmth keeping genius, many igloos have a small lip or ridge just inside the entrance. This little step isn't there to trip up unsuspecting visitors. It's actually another cold trap, creating a barrier that helps keep the warmer air from escaping when someone opens the door. It's like those plastic strips you see in grocery store freezer sections, except made of snow and a lot more picturesque. But keeping warm air in is only half the battle. You also need to make sure fresh air can get in and out without turning your cozy ice dome into an igloo-sized freezer. This is where the ventilation system comes in. 
the ingenious design of the igloo's ventilation system ensures that fresh air flows in and out efficiently while maintaining the warmth inside. By strategically placing the chingak, or the igloo's nostril, at the top, the air naturally circulates, keeping things cozy without allowing the cold to seep in. It's a perfect balance of warmth and fresh air, making it one of the most effective natural climate control systems you could imagine. This little hole does more work than a coffee maker on Monday morning. It's precisely positioned to create something called the stack effect, a natural flow of air that would make any modern HVAC engineer jealous. When warm air rises, it creates a gentle suction that pulls fresh air in through tiny gaps in the igloo's walls. These gaps are so small, you'd need a magnifying glass to spot them, but together, they create perfect airflow. What's truly remarkable is how this simple design works wonders. Researchers studying traditional igloos found that this ventilation system can exchange the entire volume of air inside every hour, all while running purely on physics, no electricity or fancy gadgets needed. The true magic lies in maintaining the perfect temperature balance. Too much ventilation and you'll feel like you're camping in a freezer. Too little and you'll end up with stale air that's about as fresh as gym socks. Traditional Inuit builders became masters at getting this just right. They could adjust the size of the ventilation hole using simple snow blocks, kind of like adjusting the volume on a radio. Except instead of controlling music, they're controlling their home's temperature. The ventilation system actually helps prevent the igloo from melting. When warm air hits the snow walls, some of it turns into water vapor. If this vapor couldn't escape, it would build up like steam in a bathroom after a hot shower, eventually making the walls wet and weak. But thanks to the steady airflow, the moisture gets carried away before it can cause any trouble. It's like having a dehumidifier built right into your house. Except this one was invented thousands of years before electricity. And on particularly cold days, you can actually see the igloo breathing. The warm air leaving through the top vent creates a tiny cloud that puffs out like dragon's breath. Some elders say they can tell how many people are inside an igloo just by watching these puffs of air. Though I suspect that's just their way of keeping track of who's skipping out on community meetings. All this talk of warm and cold air might make you wonder what's actually creating the heat inside these ice dwellings. While smart ventilation helps keep the temperature stable, the real magic happens with fire, but not the kind of campfire you're used to roasting marshmallows over, because fire inside an ice house sounds about as smart as bringing a chocolate bar to a sauna, right? But the Inuit developed something incredible called a kolik, a traditional lamp that's more efficient than your Uncle Bob's energy-saving light bulbs. This clever invention burns seal or whale oil using a moss or cotton wick, producing just enough heat to warm the space without turning your igloo into a puddle. The Quillick isn't your average camping lantern. Tests have shown that a single well-maintained Quillick can raise the temperature inside an igloo by up to 40 degrees Fahrenheit. That's like having a tiny sun in your living room, except this one won't give you a sunburn or melt your house. The lamp's design is pure genius, a shallow crescent-shaped stone bowl with a long wick that can be adjusted to control the heat output. It's basically the world's first thermostat invented centuries before someone thought to put numbers on a dial. But the Kulek isn't just about heat and light. It's a vital tool that serves multiple purposes, making it an essential part of Inuit life. The flame is positioned at just the right height to create optimal air circulation. As the warm air rises from the lamp, it creates a gentle current that moves around the dome of the igloo, warming the air without directly heating the walls. It's like having a built-in ceiling fan. Except instead of pushing around hot summer air, it's distributing life-saving warmth. The hack is knowing exactly how big to make your fire. Too small and you might as well be trying to heat your igloo with a birthday candle. Too big and suddenly your cozy ice home becomes the world's most impractical hot tub. Traditional knowledge says the ideal flame should be about as long as your thumb, not your whole hand, just the thumb. Any bigger and you risk creating too much heat, any smaller and you'll be wearing your parka indoors. Here's an amazing fact. Archaeologists have found Quileak remains dating back over 3,000 years. That means this technology is older than the Great Wall of China, the Pyramids of Giza, and probably that jar of mysterious leftovers in the back of your fridge. These lamps were so well designed that they're still used today in some traditional ceremonies, proving that sometimes the oldest solutions are the best ones. The placement of the Quileak 
is crucial too. It's typically set on a small platform made of snow, positioned just the right distance from the walls to maximize heat distribution without causing any melting. The Inuit would often have multiple kulaks in larger igloos, each one carefully placed to create overlapping zones of warmth. It's like having a multi-zone heating system, except instead of pressing buttons on a thermostat, you're orchestrating a delicate dance of flames. And the smoke from the kulak actually helps maintain the igloo structure. The tiny particles in the smoke can help seal microscopic gaps in the snow blocks, making the igloo even more weatherproof. Talk about a multi-purpose tool. It's like having a heater, light fixture, and weatherproofing service all rolled into one. Managing the heat from a qualic takes skill and practice. You need to know how to trim the wick just right, how to position the lamp for optimal heat distribution, and most importantly, how to not panic when you realize you're literally maintaining a fire inside a house made of frozen water. But while the qualic provides the base heat, there's another source of warmth that's just as important, the people inside. In fact, human body heat plays a bigger role in igloo warming than you might think. Because did you know your body pumps out heat like a tiny furnace? The average person generates about 330 British thermal units of heat per hour while resting. That's enough energy to bring a gallon of ice water to a boil. Now multiply that by a family of four or five people sharing an igloo, and you've got yourself a pretty toasty situation. It's like having several space heaters that also tell bad jokes and argue about whose turn it is to get more snow for water. The genius of igloo design really shows when it comes to using body heat. Traditional igloos were built just large enough for their intended occupants, any bigger, and they'd waste all that precious body warmth. Most family igloos were around 10 to 12 feet in diameter. That might sound cramped, but it's actually the perfect size to trap and circulate human body heat efficiently. Kind of makes you appreciate those awkward family reunions where everyone's squished together on the couch. The sleeping platform in an igloo is raised about two feet above the entrance level. Absolutely brilliant when you consider heat rising. Since warm air floats up like a teenager's attitude, elevated platform puts sleepers right in the cozy zone. Scientists have measured temperature differences of up to 15 degrees Fahrenheit between floor level and the sleeping platform. That's the difference between wearing a light jacket and needing your winter coat. What's really fascinating is how Inuit families would arrange themselves in the igloo. The youngest children usually slept closest to the back wall where it was warmest. This wasn't just parental favoritism. Kids actually generate more body heat per pound than adults. A sleeping child produces about 0.87 watts of heat per kilogram of body weight compared to an adult's 0.8 watts. They're like tiny human radiators, which explains why sharing a bed with a toddler feels like sleeping next to a small sun. The shared body heat concept goes beyond just keeping warm. It actually helps maintain the igloo structure. When people sleep in an igloo, their combined body heat causes a thin layer of snow on the inside walls to melt and refreeze, creating a stronger, more insulated shell. It's like the whole family is unknowingly participating in home improvement while they sleep. And in really cold conditions, more people means better survival chances. Studies of traditional Arctic settlements found that larger family groups had better survival rates during harsh winters, partly because they could generate more collective body heat in their shelters. It gives family bonding a whole new meaning when your survival literally depends on huddling together. The art of arranging people for optimal warmth wasn't random. It came from centuries of trial and error, passed down through generations. In fact, this is just one small part of the incredible cultural knowledge that goes into building and living in an igloo. The knowledge behind igloo building goes way deeper than just stacking up some snow blocks. Each Inuit community developed their own special techniques, passed down through stories and hands-on practice. It's like a family recipe, except instead of grandma's secret cookie ingredients, it's how to build a house that won't turn into a snow cone. Would you believe that some master igloo builders can spot perfect snow for construction just by the sound it makes when they step on it? They're listening for a specific crunch. Too soft, and it's like trying to build with cotton candy. Too hard, and it's basically just ice. They've even got specific words for different types of snow. While English has maybe 15 words for snow, some Inuit languages have over 50. There's are special words for fresh powder, wet snow, perfect building snow, and even snow that's just right for drinking water. My personal favorite is Matsuruti, snow so weak it can't hold any weight, aka the stuff that ruins your snow fort every single time. The traditional igloo builders could construct a basic shelter in under an hour. 
That's faster than most of us can build a bookshelf from Ikea. And these weren't just temporary structures. Some hunting igloos were maintained and reused for years. The longest-lasting igloo on record stood for three winters straight. Try getting your garden shed to last that long in harsh Arctic conditions. But it's not just about construction speed. There's a whole science to seasonal adaptations. Summer igloos were built with slightly different techniques than winter ones. The snow blocks would be cut thicker, and sometimes builders would add extra insulation layers using animal skins. They had to account for the midnight sun and prevent premature melting. It's like having a winter and summer wardrobe, but for your house. Modern architects have actually started studying traditional igloo design principles for inspiration. The dome shape, the insulation techniques, even the ventilation systems have influenced contemporary Arctic building designs. Who knew that thousand-year-old ice architecture would end up teaching us about modern sustainable housing? Although I'm pretty sure most modern architects draw the line at using seal oil lamps for heating. The most fascinating part is how this knowledge was preserved. Young Inuit would learn by watching and helping their elders, starting with simple tasks like cutting snow blocks and gradually moving up to more complex skills like calculating the perfect dome angle. It wasn't just about memorizing steps. They had to understand how weather, snow conditions, and seasonal changes affected construction. One elder described it as learning to read the snow like others read books. Some communities even had special igloo building competitions during festivals where builders would show off their skills and innovative techniques. These weren't just for fun. They were crucial for keeping traditional knowledge alive and encouraging new improvements to ancient designs. It's like a home improvement show, except instead of arguing about paint colors, they're competing to build the most efficient ice house possible. All these incredible techniques, perfected over thousands of years, show us just how amazing human ingenuity can be. Especially when it comes to figuring out how to stay cozy in one of the world's harshest environments.